Martins, this is Ms. Saffron, and I'm going to be going over Chinese history in the 20th century um, that is focusing on the change of government in China um, and also going over the change of China's economy over time. Um, so first, kind of looking at how does China see itself. Um, it's one of the world's oldest civilizations, over 3,000 years of recorded history. Um, the Chinese view themselves as the center of what's going on in the universe, what's going on in the world. Other East Asian countries borrowed a lot of Chinese culture, including their writing, their language, their ideograms, their philosophies. Um, they have surrounding countries that were tributary nations. Um, basically, they were kind of territories of China, but not territories. They offered gifts to the Chinese imperial court. Um, and when the Mongols controlled China, they became the Chinese. And you'll learn more about the Mongols in world history next year. So this is a old uh, Buddhist map of what China looked like um, back in the 17th century. So very different than what we have as China today, but you can see lots of waters and rivers and coastlines that make up uh, what China is. Um, so going back to what China used to be, um, it used to be a monarchy type of government or what we call a dynasty. So the last dynasty is the Qing dynasty. Um, it was considered really corrupt, unequal treaties with Europeans, um, loss of power for China and importance. Um, and eventually it's going to cause the people of China to overthrow that dynasty and go into civil war and change their government. Um, so during the Civil War, uh, Sun Yat-sen led a revolution in 1911 that ended thousands of years of dynastic rule. So this is the first change of government that we see going from an empire or a monarchy to now another type of government. Um, and this is going to cause a period of chaos and civil war because there's no organization of government, no stable government. Then you have uh, Kuomintang, which is the KMT. Um, this is a group of people in China that wanted China to become democratic. They wanted them to um, practice democratic ideals. So they were considered the Nationalist Party. And that's going to be run by Sun Yat-sen, who is going to first lead that revolution, and then General Chiang Kai-shek. And then we have a gentleman named Mao Zedong, who is going to be a huge uh, proponent in changing the government in China. He is going to start out with the KMT or the Democratic Nationalist Party. Um, as he's campaigning for this party, he's going around through rural China and seeing how people are living and seeing how poor people are. And so Mao Zedong is going to start the Chinese Communist Party, and he is going to convince people that China needs to be a communist country, that they need to work together for the state. Um, so some of his campaigning is he's going to do what's called a long march, 5,000 miles over 370 days, where he's recruiting people to become part of the Communist Party. Um, and this is going to lead a new kind of cultural uh, idea of what China is going to be like. So that is what Mao Zedong is going to look like. And there's his birthplace, so very popular place, um, especially because China is uh, what they are today. Um, so speaking of some of the tributaries, Japan, a very big uh, empire during this time period, is a former tributary of China. Um, in 1931 through 1937, Japan occupied Manchuria, which is in the northeastern part of China. Um, and there was a lot of fighting going on uh, between Japan and China right before World War II broke out. Um, Japan was trying to build their empire, and part of that was trying to take land from China. So there is going to be a war in Manchuria in 1933 between Japan and uh, China. And then in 1949, we have now another change of government. So we go from this chaotic period where we're kind of democratic, um, to now becoming communist. And in 1949, China is going to establish the People's Republic of China. Um, 
And basically it's going to start right around the Cold War period. So this is where the United States is gonna support the KMT, which are the Democratic uh, Party. The Russians, the Soviets, are gonna support the Communist Party in China. Um, and in 1949, Mao Zedong and the uh, People's Republic of China, the Communist Party, is going to defeat the Democratic Party in China. And that Democratic Party in China is going to be forced off the mainland, which is now the country of Taiwan. So in 1958, uh, one of the first big policies that the Communist Party in China is going to enact is what we call the Great Leap Forward. So some problems going on in China. There was a, a large population due to cultural demands um, and then also the favoritism of the male gender over female gender in China. So people were having babies um, to have sons. Part of the problem is there's not enough food for that population and also the need to rapidly industrialize and modernize because the rest of the world is moving on to factories and service type jobs where China was still in agriculture. So the Great Leap Forward um, is going to make agriculture become a community based job. So there's no private food production. Um, we have what is called collectivization of animals and equipment, meaning that the government owns all farming tools, all crops, all domesticated animals, um, and you are farming for the good of the country. And then if you had an industry, everything was uh, also run by the government. So small scale steel and iron production was given to the people in China to be able to start making things. But again, that is property of the government. You're doing good for the state, not for yourself. So the results of the Great Leap Forward, uh, grain production was down. Um, it's gonna be the largest famine in history. They could not grow enough food for their growing population. And because of that, because people were starving, people were even more poor under communism, uh, Mao Zedong's power is gonna weaken very much. And then in 1966, you're going to have what is called a cultural revolution. So in a communist society, not only do they take over the economy, but they also want to take over the culture because the government wants to control as much as possible in that society. Um, so if you basically were against the government, you were called class enemies, uh, where you were threatening socialism, um, if they had social classes like high, high income, middle income, low income, that did not work for the community. Remember in communism, everybody is equal. Sounds nice on paper, but in reality, it doesn't really work. Um, so the Chinese government um, started a police force called the Red Guard. They closed down schools um, and anything intellectual like universities and forced people to go work on farms. Um, the Chinese government was worried that intellectuals were going to take over. Um, and so instead, they wanted those smart people to go work in the farms, help the peasants, um, and learn from them to help grow more food. Much of China's cultural heritage is going to be destroyed because, again, if people aren't learning about it, people aren't remembering their culture. Um, millions are going to be persecuted, many deaths, because again, if you go against the government, you're considered an enemy of state. And this idea of cultural revolution is officially going to end in 1969, um, and Mao Zedong is going to die in 1976. So here's just some pictures of um, what this looks like. Um, so again, just kind of forcing people in China to change their way of thinking. And then we get to other leaders under communist rule. You have Den Xiaoping. Um, he is going to take over after Mao, and um, he was one of Mao's big followers in the Long March. His goal was to modernize the economy and maintain political control. So he wanted, under his rule, China to be this economic powerhouse, but also maintain as much government control as possible. He's going to start what is called an SEZ, or Special Economic Zones. These are big cities like Shanghai, um, Hong Kong, that have a different laws when it comes to business than the rest of China. And so under his ruling, um, China's standard of living did improve. 
And now we're starting to see a middle class form. And when people have more freedom, more money, they start to expect more out of the government. And so you're going to start to see a lot more protest against the communist government and people wanting to go democratic. And then in 2003 to 2012, you have Hu Hintao. Um, he is a reformer. He wants to modernize China even more and get China on the same playing field as the United States and Western Europe. He wants China to become a world power and regain position as a world leader. And he was a big proponent in getting uh, the Olympics in China in 2008. Um, the biggest things that he's going to have to go through is he has to uh, combat problems with capitalism. So remember, China is a communist country, so they are, are under a command economic system. And so this leader is going to have to battle why some areas in China practice capitalism and some areas in China do not. And then um, we have Xi Jinping. Um, so again, he is going to try to minimize corruption in the business world in China, um, continues market economic reforms, especially in those special economic zones, and promotes what is called the Chinese dream. And that is the idea that everybody in China is prosper, they have money, but they're still giving back to the government. They're still working for the government. There's still socialism where everybody is equal, um, but then also having this strong military, having this pride in being Chinese. Okay. So we're not gonna view the video because that just kind of goes back over Chinese revolutions. Um, so just kind of, Summarizing, um, you know, China's governments, as they change over time, their economy is going to change over time. And so China is going to go from a dynasty, which is a monarchy style of government, to democracy, um, and then eventually to communism. And under communism, they have both capitalism, economic systems in special cities, and then the rest of the country practices a command economic system. So when you go back and study, um, the human geography of China, just make sure that you keep in line the different types of governments that they've had and some of the struggles um, that being under a communist society can give you. Thanks for watching. Bye.